Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we are covering chapter nine of the environmental and natural resource economics video series. As always, I'm working off the ninth edition of the Tom Tiedenberg uh, environmental economics uh, textbook. So I've provided a link in the video description where you can check out the their Amazon page to buy the textbook if you're interested. And as always, I do recommend that you check out my uh, investment research and macroeconomic research on Seeking Alpha. So I've provided a link to my profile uh, in the video description as well for you to check that out. So in chapter nine, we're talking about water and water scarcity and I think this is quite an important chapter to to really understand not only for the course but just when when you valuing you the, your day-to-day -day contribution to the env environment right whether that's a negative or positive contribution so a quick introduction water is one of the the essential elements of life humans depend not only on the on, on the intake of water to replace the continual loss of body fluids but also on food sources that themselves need water in this chapter we examine how our economic and political institutions have allocated this important resource in the past and how they might improve on its allocation in the future. The Earth's renewable supply of water is governed by the hydrologic cycle, a system of continuous water circulation. Enormous quantities of water are cycled each year through the system, though only a fraction of circulated water is available each year for human use. And so really the problem with this is when we, th when we talk about water, it, you know, the surface level of this of when thinking about water is that okay it's a renewable resource yes it is but the speed and pace of that of the um of the evaporation and eventually the continual recycling of the water throughout the earth's hydrologic system is quite slow and so the problem with that is okay you know from from a year to year basis how much of that water that has either you know evaporated and kind of formed into clouds and begun that cycle when will that water those droplets of water return back to earth and return to our uh, to our to us and for us to be able to consume that water and so usually it takes you know multiple years right so when you think about it well you know in a, in a dry season with high consumption well all of a sudden we have to wait several years for the water that we consumed to eventually return back to us so it takes a long time of the estimated total volume of water, only 2.5% is fresh water. Of this amount, only 1% of fresh water resources, or 0.01% of the Earth's total water supply, is available for human consumption. So from a percentage perspective, when considering the amount of water available to us, it is significantly less. If we were to simply add up the available supply of fresh water on a global scale, however, and compare it to the current consumption, supply is 10 times larger than consumption. So don't let that fool you, though. Once again, we have to think about the hydrologic cycle and the time that it takes to be recycled and come back to us so that it's available for us. Available su supplies are deprived from two rather different sources. There's surface water, which includes rivers, lakes, and reservoirs, and groundwater, which collects in porous layers of underground rock. And that's the water table. Though some groundwater is renewed through percolation of rain and melted snow, most is accumulated over geologic time and cannot be recharged once it's depleted. According to the UN Environment Program in 2002, 90% of the world's readily available freshwater resources is groundwater, and only 2.5% of this is available on a renewable basis. The rest is a, is a finite resource. Therefore, groundwater is actually uh, is a depletable resource, not a renewable resource. F surface water is a renewable resource, but groundwater, the moment that we take it out of the ground, it is very difficult for that for those reservoirs to be recharged again. Therefore, we consider it a, re a depletable resource. In 2000, water withdrawals in the United States amounted to 262 billion gallons per day. Of this, approximately 83 billion gallons per day, or 32%, came from groundwater. Surface water withdrawals have been constant, while groundwater withdrawals have increased by 14%. And you can see what the problem is here. So even though surface water withdrawals have remained constant, and that's the renewable side of the water supply, from the depletable side, which groundwater, it has increased in consumption. And therefore, eventually, we're going to run out of groundwater. Although the discussion thus far has focused on the quantity of water, quality is another problem. Much of the available water is polluted with chemicals, radioactive materials, salt, or bacteria. Excessive withdrawal from aquifers is a major cause of land subsidence. In Mexico City, land has been subsiding at a rate of 1 to 3 inches per year. The city has sunk 30 feet over the last decade. And I actually have some pictures over here where you can see the city center in Mexico City, and you can kind of see just how the buildings 
are kind of changing height, right? Because in, in different areas, the the way the water table, as the water is being withdrawn from the water table, eventually, you know, the soil will continue to sink in and sink in, right? Because, you know, there's space underground, right? And that land subsidence really can impact the, the you know, architecture architectural structure of many buildings and this is a huge problem in mexico city although it's not such a big problem in i would say in canada or the united states the potential for water scarcity so probably one of the big th- uh, topics or the big projects that you'll talk about in uh, in your course is the the arizona or C- central arizona project so in in phoenix arizona in 1999 a section of the canal that carries 80 percent of, se- of the central arizona project water has been s- subsiding sinking at a rate of approximately 0.2 feet per year continued subsidence would reduce the delivery capacity of the canal by almost 20 percent by 2005. so this project takes a lot of the runoff water from the Rockies region up in Colorado and it kind of it's an ir- it's a very large irrigation system that is able to carry a lot of this water to farms in in the mainland region in the center of of the United States and so it offers that ability to really carry that water although one of the big problems is with land subsidence the ability the, the, the kind of like the capacity and the speed at which that water flows through these different canals slows down because of, again that variability in the height of, of the land and in a short term response the lining of the canal was raised as a longer term response Arizona has been injecting ground water aquifers with surface water to replenish the groundwater tables and this is called artificial recharge now this is not a realistic long-term solution because to really refill all of the groundwater tables across you know the north america it would take a lot of water and just doesn't make sense although in a short-term response this is what they did now the allocation discussion needs to be split into two the topic of surface water which is renewable and groundwater which is a depletable resource in the absence of storage the allocation of surface water involves distributing a fixed renewable supply among competing users intergenerational effects are less important because future supplies depend on that on the natural natural phenomenon for groundwater withdrawing water now does affect the resources available to future generations because it won't recharge now an efficient allocation of surface water must one strike a balance among a host a host of competing users and why well potential users all have legitimate claims some such as municipal municipal suppliers or farmers use the water for consumptive use while others such as swimmers use it for uh use the water for recreational use now in addition a supply uh, the supply they have to supply an acceptable means of handling the year-to-year variability in water flow so some years there will be more water available to people and some years there will be less and s- since you know that changes in precipitation runoff and evaporation you need to uh, be able to supply that those year-to-year change with respect to allocating uh, among competing users the factors of efficiency are quite clear the water should be allocated so that the marginal net benefit is equalized for all uses and so this is very important to understand a quick example if i value this gal the, a liter of water at five dollars while well, you value it at three dollars society benefits if i get more because the amount of the, the the value of that one liter is higher for me than it is for you if i value water at four dollars and you value it at four dollars per liter then society has allocated efficiently because whichever way we go you'll get the same amount of uh, net benefit and therefore you know we've hit that equilibrium and that so therefore total total economic surplus is maximized and so that's really important to understand when we are talking about the inefficiencies of water allocation later in the video okay the bottom line is that if marginal net benefits have not been equalized it is always possible to increase net benefits by transferring water from those users with low net marginal benefits to those with higher net marginal benefits by transferring the water to the users who value the marginal water more the net benefits of the water use are increased those losing water are giving up less than those receiving the additional water are gaining now here, here we're going to take a look at oh there's a spelling mistake two individuals uh so we're going to look at two individual marginal net benefit curves which are depicted over here and so we're considering supply s zero okay so you have your marginal ben- net benefit for person a and person b and then the aggregate marginal uh marginal net benefit curve which kind of begins here and eventually ends here now uh, in a scenario where uh, the supply is at, at this point right over here at Q0, well, then the intersection point between the supply line and the aggregate marginal net benefit uh, line is where the efficient allocation is, right? And so the marginal net benefit for person A, so the person A will receive a quantity of QA and pers- uh, a person A will receive a quantity of QB and person B will receive a quantity of QA.
Okay, and then that will sum up to Q0. Now, notice that the marginal net benefit for both users is positive. This implies that water sales should involve a positive marginal scarcity rent. Mar marginal scarcity rent would be zero if water were not scarce. If the availability of water, as presented, was greater than the amount represented by the point where the aggregate marginal net benefit curve intersects the axis, the water would not be scarce. So essentially what this means is the supply line over here at S0, so Q0, if this supply line was moved all the way to this point right over here, then water would be considered, uh, there would be an abundance of water, water would not be considered considered scarce and therefore there would be no marginal uh, positive marginal scarcity rent in a scenario where there is and either it intersects the aggregate marginal net benefit curve or intersects one of these curves then water is considered scarce and therefore there is a positive marginal scarcity rent that is existent in that scenario right uh, now consider uh, S1. So now we've moved that supply line inwards and so in this scenario now water is very very scarce and the intersection point between you know person uh, person A's a marginal net benefit line and the supply line is where the efficient allocation is. But in this scenario, all of the supply is allocated to person A because at any point between zero and S one, person A's a marginal net benefit line is above person B's, and therefore they will all of the supply will be allocated to them. So the marginal benefit curve for water in use A lies above that for B, implying that as supplies diminish, the cost or the foregone net benefits of doing without water is much higher for person A than for person B. To minimize this cost, more of the burden of the shortfall is allocated to B than A. So because the person A values the water more than person B, in society's view, then uh, all of the scarce amount of water should be allocated to person A while person B really takes on that burden and higher cost. Now, this is something that we talked about in chapter six, so I do recommend if you haven't watched that video, you go back to there. But when withdrawals exceed recharge from a particular aquifer, the resource will be mined over time until either supplies are exhausted or the marginal cost of pumping additional water becomes prohibitive. This is similar to the case in chapter six, where the marginal extraction cost increases over time. And so just quickly recapping these two charts over here. Now, the first one talks about the quantity extracted across time. And so with a depletable resource over time, uh, eventually, you know, you will consume more and more and more and less will be available for future generations. And at, at the switch point, at that point, we stop consuming that depletable resource and switch over to a renewable resource. Now, when does that switch occur? Well, in the chart over here, B, now this, this displays the marginal cost for that particular unit over that period of time, right? And so as marginal cost increases, eventually it becomes too costly to continue to consume that depletable resource. And so the intersection point between the fixed marginal cost for the renewable resource and the increasing marginal cost for the de depletable resource, at that point, that's where the transition point occurs. And marginal cost is increasing for that depletable resource because the extraction cost increases. So as it costs more to really take out that depletable resource, as you have to dig deeper and deeper to find what's left of that water or what's left of whatever depletable resource we're talking about, well, then marginal cost continues to increase, eventually not making it profitable to consume that depletable resource and therefore shift to a renewable resource resource. When the demand curve is stable over time and not shifting out due to population or income increases, the efficient extraction path involves temporarily declining use of groundwater. The marginal extraction cost, the cost of pumping the last unit to the surface, would rise over time as the water table fell. Pumping, pumping would e either stop when one, the water table r r runs dry, or two, and probably the more likely scenario, when the marginal cost of pumping was either greater than the marginal benefit of the water or greater than the marginal cost of acquiring water from another source. In efficient groundwater markets, the water price would rise over time to really match that you know, rise, increase in extraction costs. The rise would continue until the point of exhaustion, the point at which the marginal pumping cost becomes prohibitive or when the marginal cost of pumping becomes equal to the next least expensive source of water. At that point, the marginal pumping cost and the price would be equal and, there, and then, then the transition would occur, okay? Now, let's talk about the current allocation system. And this is probably a little bit confusing, but I'll kind of go through it slowly. Now, economically efficient allocations have not resulted due to uh, have, have have not resulted due to poor legal and institutional frameworks. Now, in the earliest days of settlement in the American Southwest, 
and west, the first settlements usually oriented near bodies of water, right? Because that's where probably the most ag best agricultural land was. The property rights that evolved were riparian rights, which allocated the right to use the water to the owner of the land adjacent to the water. This was a particular solution because by virtue of their location, these owners had easy access to the water. With population growth and the consequent rise in demand for land, this allocation system became less appropriate, right? So farmers lived, whatever farmers or owners of the land beside those bodies of water, they had access to that water and they technically owned that water under riparian rights. But as society continued to develop, you know, the cost of doing business with solely those farmers who are considered owners of that, of that water, it became too high. As demand increased, the amount of land adjacent to the water became scarce, forcing some spillover onto lands that were not adjacent to water. The owners of this land began to seek means of acquiring water to make their land more productive. During the gold rush, with demand for change, uh, for change increasing, a new doctrine was set. The waste resulting from the lack of transferability under riparian rights became so great that it outweighed any transition costs of changing the system of property rights. The evolution that took place in the mining camps became the forerunner of what ha has become known as the prior appropriation doctrine. The miners established the custom that the first person to arrive had the superior or senior claim on the water. Later claimants had junior or subordinate claims. Stimulated by profits that could be made in shifting water to more viable uses, private companies were formed to construct irrigation systems. Okay, so whoever, essentially it's a first come first serve basis, you know, whoever got to the water first and, you know, they would continue to use that water. But the moment that they stopped using that water, they would lose the right to that water. Okay. Now, the earliest incursions of government involved establishing the principle that the ownership of water properly belonged to the state. Claimants were ac accorded a right to use, known as use of fruit. I can't even pronounce this word. Use a fructuary right rather than an ownership right. The, establish the establishment of this principle of a public ownership was followed in short order by the establishment of state control over the rates charged by the private irrigation companies. So essentially, the modern day right is the use of fructuary right, which essentially means that the state really owns that water. But you have the right to use that water based upon, you know, the ability to use it in a correct way and whatever the government deems correct. OK, and so a quick recap, you have the current state and you have the right to use the water without altering it. But ultimately, the state owns the water. You have the prior appropriation doctrine, which is the first come first serve basis. And then riparian rights, where the person who lives beside the water has the right to use it. If he or she doesn't, they can lose that right. OK. Now, let's talk about the sources of inefficiency, and this is probably you know, really important to understand for your exam. The current system is not efficient. Primary inefficiency results from restrictions on water transfers, which limits the ability to allocate that water to the highest valid use. So we talked about the marginal net benefits. Marginal net benefits for all uses need to be equalized. If they are not, the system is inefficient. And the problem, the, the source of that inefficiency, inefficiency comes from the lack of ability and transferability of those rights towards the people who value them the highest, right? So the restrictions of transfers, there's also federal re reclamation projects, uh, municipal and industrial water pricing is a huge problem. There's in-stream in flow problems and common property and open access problems. Problems. So we'll talk about these in the following slides. So first off, restrictions on transfers. To achieve an efficient allocation of water, the marginal net benefits would have to be equalized across all uses, including non-consumptive uh, in-stream uses of the water. With a well-structured system of water property rights, efficiency can be uh, a direct result of the transferability of the rights. So under a efficient allocation, under an, a, un, in a utopian world where there are no restrictions on transfers, it will make sense over the long term that uh, if someone owns uh, owns a piece of, you know, has the right to use this water and someone else values that water at a higher price, they will pay up until maybe $1 less of what they value that water to acquire those rights in order to benefit that one remaining dollar, right? And in society's view, that increases the total economic benefit from, you know, water uses, okay? So users receiving low marginal net benefits from their current allocation would trade their rights to those who receive higher net benefits. Both parties would be better off. Unfortunately, the existing mixed system of prior appropriation rights, coupled with quite restrictive federal and state laws, have diminished the degree of transferability that can take place. Diminished transferability, in turn, reduces the market's pressures toward equalization of the marginal net benefits. So the restrictive federal and state laws have limited the ability to transfer these water rights. 
Now, the beneficial use is another source of inefficiency. One of the earliest restrictions required users to fully exercise their water rights or else they would lose them. So use it or lose it. The principle of beneficial use was typically applied to off-stream consumptive uses. It is not difficult to see why this use it or lose it principle does, does not does it the incentive to conserve. Particularly, uh, particularly careful users who at their own expense find ways to use less water would find their allocations reduced accordingly because they, with the moment that they stop using it and kind of find more efficient allocations, well, then the state will come around and be like, oh, you're not using it, then we're going to transfer it to someone who is going to use it. And that's inefficient. Okay, so beneficial use is a very inefficient system. There's also preferential use. A second restriction known as preferential use attempts to establish bureaucratically a value hierarchy of uses. With this doctrine, the government attempts to establish allocation priorities across categories of water. The doctrine supports three different types of inefficiencies. It substitutes a bureaucratically determined set of priorities for market priorities. It reduces the incentive to make investments in lower preference categories, and it allocates the risk of shortfalls in an efficient way. So essentially, preferential use is a, a is a value system of different levels that the government has set out. And the top levels uh, consider the priority level, whereas lower levels are le uh, le prioritized less. Now, in this system, you know, the government will focus on that top level because it is assumed that it is that priority. But economically, eventually, if you continue to allocate so much water to the top level, well, the marginal net benefit of the, of the next unit is significantly lower than the lower levels. And so the question of can we transfer it to a lower level in a bureau bureaucratic system it would be rejected because at the end of the day well our priority is the top level not the bottom level and so that's what prefer preferential use is now let's delve into this third point so the third point actually is it allocates the risk of shortfalls in an inefficient way so what does that mean so we understand one uh, so point one talks about uh, substituting a bureauc bureaucratically determined system with market priorities and, you know, that the changes in marginal ben net benefits. And it also reduces the incentive to make uh, investments in the lower preference categories because the government would not does not want to focus on those lower preference categories. But point three, what does it mean by risk of shortfalls in an inefficient way? Well, because water supplies f fluctuate over time. Unusual scarcities can occur in any particular year. With well-defined property rights, the most damaged by the shortfall would purchase a larger share of the diminished water from those who are suffering uh, smaller consequences. So, you know, as we talked about with the marginal benefits, under a scar scarcity scenario, those who would be hurt most by that scarcity scenario will value the water more, and therefore they will acquire a larger share. By limiting the ability to transfer rights from high preferential categories to lower preferential categories, the damage caused by shortfalls increases in magnitude. So consider a scenario where the marginal net benefit in a scarcity scenario is significantly higher in a lower preferential category than those in the top preferential category. Well, the transfer would be restricted under preferential use because it's in a lower category, even though in society standards and economic terms, well, the marginal net benefit is significantly higher in that lower level. And so that's really one of the big challenges. Now, there's also natural challenges. Another factor that makes water difficult to transfer is the fact that only a portion of the water withdrawn from a stream is typically consumed. As, um, as long as the withdrawal gets put to use in the same river basin, a portion of the water returns to the stream eventually in the form of return flow. Crops grown with irrigated water, for example, use only a portion of water put on the field, called the consumptive use portion. The remainder either evaporates or flows through the soil, eventually finding its way back to the original water source. So there are natural challenges. You know, if you have a bucket of water and you have a garden and you pour that bucket of water and you kind of like water your garden, some of that water will be kind of dry up and will evaporate if the sun is beating and, you know, and it's just a very sunny day. Whereas the, the remaining portion, the consumptive use portion, will be absorbed by the plants and, you know, and grow the garden. Now, there's also, uh, d due to low energy costs and federal subsidies, agricultural irrigation became the dominant use of water in the West. Yet the marginal net benefits from agricultural uses are lower, sometimes substantially lower, than the marginal net benefits of water use by municipalities uh, and industry. A transfer of water from irrigated ag agriculture to those of other uses would rise net benefits. Right, And that's quite important to understand. You know, the, the huge focus for irrigation systems has been, you know, agricultural uh, farms, right? It's and they're huge and you know the society depends on you know generating the you know the amount of food that they produce but at the same time when you th when you analyze them from an economic perspective the marginal net benefits of those farms are significantly lower than the marginal net benefits of some other uses especially in municipalities or in other industries
Now, by providing subsidies to approve projects, and this is a, uh, talking about, you know, the uh, Arizona project, the water project, and other federal reclamation projects, by providing those subsidies, by, you know, creating these projects, uh, federal reclamation projects have diverted water to th these projects, even though the net benefits were negative. Consider the subsidies to irrigated agriculture in the wetlands water district. The Westlands uh, Water District paid about ten to twelve dollars per acre, uh, less than ten percent of the unsubsidized cost of delivering water to the district. The resulting subsidy was estimated to be two hundred seventeen per uh, dollars per irrigated acre, or five hundred thousand dollars per year for the average size farm. So essentially, when you subsidize the cost of transfer for that water. Uh, people um, uh, who value the water significantly less are, will be considered in that allocation now because when you talk about the marginal cost, well, if the marginal cost is subsidized and significantly lower, then you're introducing uh, other co consumptive uses that uh, have a lower marginal net benefit, right? So that's really important, and that's why subsidies are also inefficient. Now, the, the big problem is municipal and industrial water pricing. Prices, uh, prices charged by water distribution utilities do not promote efficiency of use either. Both the level of prices and the rate structure are at, are at fault. In general, the price level is too low and the rate structure does not adequately, adequately reflect the cost of providing service to different types of consumers. For surface water, the rates are too low for two rather distinct reasons. One, historic average costs are used to determine rates, and two, marginal scarcity rent is rarely included so when we think about you know prices well essentially you know as a consumer you're looking for the lowest price you want to benefit from the lowest price so you're you know you so you don't pay such a high water bill and so focusing on point one uh, talking about historic costs hello where's my mouse uh, oh there's my mouse so focusing on uh, point one historic average costs well when you think about it would you be comfortable with seeing your water bill jump from i don't know a dollar per liter to fifteen dollars per liter if the if the water companies were to fully account for the marginal cost no because you just totally freak out and then you'd okay i'm going to go to another system thankfully enough there are monopoly systems and so this point is not as strong but still it is a big shock to the system and therefore it limits the the uh, the availability of raising price at a significant level and therefore water companies raise it at a very small and incremental price year over year now in addition the marginal scarcity rent when you don't raise it by that is is rarely included and therefore you know you you really underprice the water and as we talked about in multiple chapters when the, the price of a depletable resource is significantly lower than it's actually so social cost well then you know the so society can over consumes that and undervalues that resource and therefore eventually it is over exhausted and it runs out and we have problems right and it, in a scenario where we run out of water we would all be die dead okay so there is a failure by regulators overseeing the operations of water distribution companies to allow a scarcity rent to be incorporated in the calculation of the appropriate price for a non-renewable resource, an efficient price should uh, should equal marginal cost plus marginal user cost. And so we talked about marginal user cost in Chapter 5. And essentially, inter intertemporal scarcity, which is the scarcity between different generations, imposes an opportunity cost that we henceforth refer to as the marginal user cost. So price, the real price and the, the efficient price that uh, municipal... Uh, providers of water would have would charge would be a price that equals marginal cost for providing that water plus the marginal user cost and recall marginal user cost is essentially the uh, the opportunity cost of consuming something today rather than leaving it for a future generation right and in a, in a scarcity scenario if something's very scarce and you know you're in the present and you consume that scarce resource now well the a foregone benefit of it con being consumed in a future date is represented by that marginal uh, user cost. Okay. Now there are also in-stream flows. Those are these are another sources of inefficiency. So there's off-stream flows, which is the use of water uh, withdrawn or diverted from groundwater or surface water, and it's for, used for public water, industry, irrigation, livestock, and thermoelectric power generation. And then you have in-stream use, which refers to water use use taking place within a stream channel. Examples are hydroelectric to power generation, navigation, fishing, uh, and recreational activities, right? So non-consumptive uses. So off-stream is consumptive uses, whereas in-stream is non-consumptive uses, okay? Now, in 2001, the federal government cut off water to farmers 
in the Klamath River Basin to protect threatened coho salmon, which are uh, protected under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Farmers responded by forcing open irrigation gates and forming a bucket brigade to dump water on their fields. So really, when you talk about in-stream flows, society doesn't really value you know, the non-consumptive uses of water. When you talk about, oh, you know, do I value this guy jet skiing on this lake or do I value it, that water being used on in 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 really you know watering my plants for my for my farm well you probably value you know that farm more than the guy riding the jet ski even though when you again account for all of the different factors especially scarcity rent and you know the environmental impacts probably the the use of you know just leaving that water alone and letting people just you know enjoy recreational activities on it is higher than the marginal net benefit of the farm but that so and we talked about this so it's not always the case a study on the Rio Grande River in New Mexico found that diverting water from upstream agriculture in order to provide minimum in-stream flows for an endangered mineral species increased net benefits by making more water water available for high valued downstream uses so there are multiple cases where you'll see that you know in-stream uses are significantly higher valued than um, than offstream uses okay now of course, open access problem is a huge uh, is a huge problem, and we talked about this in chapter two, I believe. You know, with the with the basin, the buffalo, uh, the allocation of groundwater must confront one additional problem. When many users tap the same aquifer, the aquifer can become an open access resource. Tapping an open uh, access resource will tend to deplete it too rapidly. Users lose the incentive to conserve, and the marginal sc scarcity rent will be ignored. So you maximize your total total economic surplus, where marginal revenues equal the marginal cost. So where um, you know you have your marginal cost and your marginal benefit, and so really consumption of this in this in this example is at E1. But when it is an open access resource, and you know people all use that lake for whatever consumptive use they they're using, well then you know they they will really equalize average benefits with marginal cost, and therefore you know they'll consume a significantly higher level at E2, and eventually that will exhaust supplies much quicker. And that's really the problem with a lot of lakes uh, in in very in metropolitan areas where you have different people uh, different people using it in different ways. Whether they're fishing or they're enjoying it, or you know they're dumping waste or they're taking some of that water, you know, for their restaurant or whatever, you know. People don't consider the, uh, the the impact of other users. They only consider their own impact, and therefore they consider their average benefit and average cost rather than their marginal benefit and marginal cost. Okay. Now, what are some potential remedies? These reforms would promote efficiency of water use while affording more protection to the interests of future generations of water uses. So the water transfers and water ma markets are important. There's in-stream flow protection from the government. Of course, water prices and fixing water prices and, and desalination, which is essentially, you know, filtering and, uh, you know, converting uh, salt water from oceans into drinking water and fresh water that can be used in our day-to-day -day lives. Now, the first reform would reduce the number of restrictions on water transfers. The use it or lose it component that often accompanies the prior appropriation doctrine can promote the extravagant use of water and discourage conservation. Allowing users to capture the value of water saved by permitting them to sell it would stimulate water conservation and allow the water to flow to higher valued uses. Water markets and water banks are being increasingly utilized to transfer water seasonally via short-term leases or on a long-term basis, either by multiple year leases or permanent transfers. While most markets and banks are restricted to certain geological areas, water is allowed to move to its high, higher valued use to some extent. Buyers and sellers are brought together through bulletin boards, water brokers, and electronic computer networks. So essentially, water transfers and water markets are areas uh, are there it's a you know a medium of exchange where you have a, a the owner of water rights and, and someone who values those water rights at a significant higher level complete that transaction and transfer that in a standardized and efficient way right and so that the water market provides that opportunity in stream flow protection so achieving a balance between in stream and consumptive uses is not easy as the competition for water increases the pressure to allocate larger amounts of the stream for consumptive uses increases as well eventually the water level becomes too low to support aquatic life and recreational activities so two problems exist right you have the free riders so are you willing to pay to protect th this lake in which you you are swimming in or do you just kind of ignore that and benefit off the protection provided by others and there's also uh, their use to protect in stream um, flows may not be considered beneficial use. So is it considered uh, a top priority for the government or is it not considered or for the state?
and also water prices. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this. This is quite important. You should know this for your exam. Recognizing the inefficiencies associated with subsidizing the consumption of a scarce resource, the U.S. Congress passed the Central Valley Project Improvement Act in 1992. A study was done on different types of water pricing strategies. So here are the different water pricing strategies that they considered. You have volumetric, which is essentially the volume of water that you consume. You have output. And so essentially, instead of considering the amount of water that you consume, it, uh, the, the, you know, the municipality will charge you based on the output of your farm or based on the output of your business. And it will, of course, calculate a, a certain ratio of that output and then charge you based on the output of your business rather than the use of your water. There's also input. So the amount of stuff that you buy, whether, you know, it's crop or whether it's it's items that you are, you know, converting. So uh, if you're, you know, buying intermediate goods to eventually produce final goods, right? So it, it, it calculates the, you know, your water bill based off, you know, what your, the inputs of your business, then you have per area, which is essentially regional charged, there's the block rate, where there's, uh, you know, step, it's a declining or inverted block rate. So it either increases or decreases over time, based on the amount that you consume, then you have two parts, so you can be seasonal and non seasonal, and also a water market where prices are changed dependent upon supply and demand on a either day to day or week to week basis, right. So there are many, many different systems, okay, kind of understand them all but not like you know very in depth just understand when you read one of the pricing scheme, uh, schemes you at least understand a little bit of what that charge involves okay so the two part charges in volumetric pricing while quite efficient require information on the amount of water used by each farmer and are rarely used in developing countries the problem with these uh, these two pricing schemes is that you need honesty from that farmer to tell you how much water did i use yes you can you know put like a water meter to check but there's a lot of other ways that that will farmer might acquire that water and therefore might lie when being charged, right? Because it's in their, in their incentive to lower their costs and therefore they will, um, you know, uh, lie, okay? Output pricing, where the charge for water is linked to agricultural output, not water use, is less efficient, on, but only requires data on each water user's production. So the data is much more transparent when it comes to output pricing. The problem is it's not very efficient in actually calculating the cost, uh, the marginal cost of the water. Now there's input-based pricing, which is even easier because it doesn't require mon monitoring either water use or output. Under input pricing, irrigators are assessed taxes on water-related inputs, such as a per unit charge on fertilizer. So with inputs, you know, the government would provide uh, or would charge an additional tax on whatever input that business uh, is going to buy. And so that additional cost of the business reflects, you know, the higher marginal cost of consumption of water, although it is not as efficient as as we talk about, you know, two part charges or volumetric charges. OK, there's area pricing, which is probably the easiest to implement since the only information necessary is the amount of irrigated land and the type of crop produced on that land, although this method is the most common. It is not efficient since the marginal cost of extraction water use is zero. So we're not really focusing on the actual use of it, but rather just the region's use. And so that's really a, a problem and inefficient. OK, now for water distribution utilities, the traditional practice of recovering only the cost of distributing water and treating the water itself as a free good should be abandoned. Instead, utilities should adopt a pricing system that reflects increasing marginal cost and that includes a scarcity value for groundwater. Scarce water is not in any meaningful sense a free good. Only if the user cost of that water is imposed on current users will the proper incentive for conservation be created and the interests of future generations of water users be preserved. So essentially this means that you know the current utilities charge only the marginal cost of delivering that water and the actual inventory of the existing water that they have is considered free. They don't value that inventory. Now in an efficient allocation, they would actually consider the scarcity of that water and as they continue to provide more and more water, the price would, would reflect, reflect that by increasing over time because either the marginal extraction or marginal use of, uh, of, of, that, uh, of that water increases from a cost basis. Okay. Now here are so four common uh, water pricing structures. So in addition to the study that we talked about, you know, there's the declining block rate, which we talked about. So uh, over time, you know, over, uh, as usages increase, the price per unit falls. You have the uniform rate structure where it's just the same, uh, regardless of what usage. You have the inverted block uh, rate 
unit structure where uh, as usage increases, the per unit cost increases. And then you have the seasonal rate, or we talked about that two, uh, uh, two price structure where you have a peak rate, uh, peak season rate and a non-peak season rate dependent upon, you know, the usage levels in uh, during different time periods. OK, and so here are some information on, you know, the different structures and the different uh, pricing schemes. And as you can see in uh, in the United States, um, there's a 40% of, you know, the different municipalities uh, use an increasing block structure uh, in 2008, whereas uh, in 1982, there was a decreasing block 60% of states. So decreasing block is essentially the declining block rate, whereas increasing is the inverted block rate. So in 1982, when states were just completely clueless on the marginal extraction cost of water, they were charging a decreasing block. They were they completely ignored the situation. Whereas in 2008, they've now kind of moved towards an increasing block, but still that does not fully value the water and the marginal extraction cost, right? Because it's dependent upon increased and significant increased usage, right? So at this point, that price remains the same, even though if if we lose a bunch of water and all of a sudden it's a scarce season and we still consume only that much, we're well, still priced at the lowest level, even though the marginal cost of extraction is significantly higher in this peak season, right? So that's really important to understand. Now, efficiency dictates that prices equal the marginal cost of provision, including marginal user cost, when appropriate. Another aspect of the marginal cost pricing theorem is that when it costs a water utility more to serve one class of customers than another, each class of customers should bear the cost associated with its respective service. Typically, this implies that those farther away from the source or at a higher elevations, which require more pipe pumping, should pay higher rates. So those farther away from water, water sources need to be charged more than those who are closer. And so that is, again, makes logical sense. Now, a useful piece of information for utilities is how much their uh, consumers respond to given price increases. Municipal water use is expected to be price inelastic, meaning that a 1% increase in price consumers reduce consumption, but by less than 1%. A meta-analysis of 24 water demand studies calculated a mean of negative 0.51. So yes, the price of water is inelastic. And essentially, because water is so important to our day-to-day -day lives, when the prices increase, we can't really respond fully with an opposite decline in, in consumption. It also turns out that the price elasticity of demand is related to the local climate. Residential demand for water turns out to be more price elastic in arid climates than in wet ones. So in regions in, in, in arid climates and warmer climates where uh, where, you know, we actually uh, those users need water even more. The actually the elasticity of, of the price, the price elasticity of water is significantly higher. Why? Well, I, I research states that essentially because they're so used to that scarcity of water, their, 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 their ability to respond to changes in the water price are significantly higher than those who have been spoiled with a lot of access to water. OK, now the final uh, remedy is desalination. So technological advances in reserve, reverse osmosis, so pumping through permeable membranes and, and nanofiltration and ultrafiltration methods have reduced the price of uh, desalinized water, making it a potential new source for water scarce reasons. As of 2005, more than 10,000 desalinating plants have been installed or contracted worldwide. Since 2000, desalination capacity has been growing at approximately 7% per year. And here's a proposed project project in Dubai that I pulled off, you know, Google, I was doing a little bit of research. And so, you know, especially in, in the Middle East, where, you know, access to fresh water is, is, is a significant problem. Uh, desalination is a is a potential remedy that uh, will be considered in future generations. And I believe that Israel is one of the top countries in the world when it comes to desalinized water, they actually uh, make up probably 30% of the available water that they use. So that's a big um, proponent of the amount of water that that's available to that country. And will probably uh, desalinization in the process of this will probably be very important for a lot of countries in the future as well, when groundwater runs out. Okay, so overall, any solution should focus on the following three points. More expensive to serve users should pay a higher price. A more costly source of water is introduced. Users should pay the marginal cost of that water. And the peak demanders should pay the higher costs associated with the expansion. So these are very important. It's all based upon water pricing. Really, water pricing is the most important uh, aspect and probably the most important, uh, uh, most valuable solution when talking about water scarcity. 
One strategy that has received more attention in the last couple of decades is the privatization of water supplies. Whereas privatization of water supplies turns the entire system over to the private sector, privatization of access rights is only, esta uh, only establishes specific quantified rights to use the pu uh, publicly supplied water. Privatization of access rights is one way to solve the excess that follow from free access problem. And so essentially, uh, you know, this is, you know, a conclusion at the end of the chapter, the, the author proposes a solution in which we transfer the rights from state control to private control. And how, as with many other private, uh, private markets, the the ability to price that respective good in this case water is significantly more easy and efficient rather than you know the public market where governments are significantly slower at responding to different changes and are more self-interested in you know the short term rather than the long term so that's a very uh, a, a very kind of unrealistic remedy because i don't believe really the government will ever relinquish its rights to to water but it is a very p strong potential remedy so that's pretty much it for this chapter. As always, if you are interested in this PowerPoint, do comment below and I'll be sure to kind of reply and, and get the PowerPoint to you. Uh, if you have any other questions or concerns, do comment as well. Uh, as always, check out my research on Seeking Alpha. I've provided a link in the video description. And if you've liked this video, please like and subscribe to the channel for more. I do appreciate any support as it does take a long time. And as I can see, it's, the video has been 45 minutes. As always, good luck guys with your school and have a nice day.